as we continue along in our little study here on battles in the Bible and how they relate to the battles we go through every day. Do we go through battles? Do we go through storms and troubles and struggles? Yes, we do. Who promised we would have those? Jesus did, yeah. He said, in this world you will have struggles, right? He knew what we were going to go through. In fact, we just read what Jesus said to his disciples before he went to the cross. What did he say? Don't let things trouble you, which means you're going to have what? Troubles. <laughs> Don't let them get to you because we are going to win in the end. It's going to be okay. I'm with you all the way. It's going to be fine, right? We need to get that in mind. Now, so far, we've seen a couple of battles. The first one we looked at, it reminded us that sometimes we've got to help other people, don't we? Sometimes we'll be dragged into their battles. Sometimes we will need to step up and help them because then when we help them, they'll be able to help us, right? So they can, no, see, why why are you shaking your head? Oh, you were here. Yes, of course not. We don't do it for what we can get. We do it because who has told us to? God has told us to. And we can be a blessing. We can be a witness. We can be a light. We can be help to those around us. So we need to look around us. We need to be willing to help one another with our battles. By the way, just a little hint, when we're helping others with our battles, our battles seem smaller. <laughs> it just does. But sometimes we have to admit that we need what? Help. <laughs> and sometimes that's even harder. Sometimes it's easier to just go help other people, but when you need help, it's kind of say, oh, I don't want to be weak, I don't want to be, I don't want to let people know that I've got problems, things like that. But what does God say? Sometimes you need help. And we can get through this, and God is there, but who does God use to help us? <laughs> other people. So we've got to be there and be willing, but also we need to let others help us. And today we're going to come up on obstacles. And you'll see there right at the top, facing impossible obstacles. Who says they're impossible? We do. (laughs) And that's the problem. And how big are our obstacles? How big are our struggles? I want you to think about the big things in your life right now. Some of you may have very big obstacles. Some of you may have some very big struggles. Some of you may be going through very big battles. This isn't to diminish that. Sometimes they are big. Sometimes they're huge. Sometimes they're all-consuming. Sometimes they can take over our life, can't they? But when you're sitting there thinking about how big your struggles are, how big your problems are, how big your obstacles are, I want you to also ask yourself, how big is your God? Is He bigger than the boogeyman? Any VeggieTales fans out there? No, God is bigger than the... No, okay, all right. (laughs) Instead of doing VeggieTales and singing for you, I'm going to go to an uh, old poem. Uh, one of the things we're going to do during camp this week is we're going to um, make these kids literate. <laughs> we're going to read them poems. <laughs> but this is one of the ones I, I found interesting. I think it would be good for you. This is an old poem by James Thomas Fields. And it says, We were crowded in the cabin, not a soul would dare to sleep. It was midnight on the waters, and a storm was on the deep. Tis a fearful thing in winter to be shattered by the blast and to hear the rattling trumpet thunder cut away the mast. So we shuddered there in silence for the stoutest held his breath while the hungry sea was roaring and the breakers talked with death. As thus we sat in darkness, each one busy with his prayers, we are lost, the captain shouted as he staggered down the stairs. But his little daughter whispered, as she took his icy hand, Isn't God upon the ocean just the same as on the land? Then we kissed the little maiden, and we spake in better cheer, and we anchored safe in harbor when the morn was shining clear. (laughs) I like that. Isn't God the same God on dry land as he is in the middle of the storm? (laughs) Isn't he the same God in the good times and the bad times? Isn't he the same God in the valley as well as the mountaintop? That old song? Could have sang that today. Is he the same God? And is he just as big? And is he still there for you? No matter what the obstacle. And today we're going to look at a battle that everybody's very familiar with that talks about all this. Let's all go to not... Cross out Exodus. That's just from last week. So... (laughs) Cross that out. Let's go to Numbers chapter 13. And that's where this really starts. Today's story starts in Numbers 13, but we're going to be going to Joshua. Because this is the battle of Jericho. 
But really, this starts back when Moses first came to the land and brought the people to the promised land. I mean, this is what they've been wanting for. This is what they've been praying for. This is what their desire has been, as now for two years they've been traveling from Egypt to a land that would be flowing with milk and honey. They wouldn't have to eat that manna anymore. They would have beds to live in. They would have new clothes. I mean, everything they hoped for, everything they dreamed for, all the blessings of God were now within their grasp as they stood there. But then they sent 12 spies in. Twelve men went to spy on Canaan. Ten were bad and two were good. Anybody know that song? We'll be singing that next week. But ten of the spies came back and said what? We can't do it. We can't go in that land. Why? Let's look at Numbers chapter 13 starting in verse 27. Numbers 13 verse 27 it says And they told him and said, We came unto the land whither thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey. And this is the fruit of it. And they showed the fruit. In fact, it took two people to carry one thing of grapes. Now, most of you have probably never seen something like that, but they grow like that in California. (laughs) They're huge. I mean, they stand about this tall, from there to the ground. And the grapes are about this big around. So they, they call them wine grapes. <laughs> they get a lot of wine out of those bunches. But they, it took two of them to carry these bunches, and they had fruit, and they had honey, and they had milk, and they had all these wonderful things from the land. So did they say God's blessings were true? Were God's blessings there? Was God telling them the truth about how wonderful it was? Yes, but look at verse 28. Nevertheless, the people be strong and dwell in the land. And the cities are walled and very great, very big. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there, the giants. And Amaleks dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. In other words, what? The obstacles are too big. Yes, the blessings are there. Yes, God has kept His promise. Yes, it's a wonderful place. But we can't get to God's blessings. We cannot get to that good land. We cannot get there. Why? Because the obstacles are what? Too big. The people are too strong. The people are too tall. And the walls? How are we going to get through a wall? (laughs) How are we going to take a city? We don't have supplies. We don't have an army. We don't have any helicopters. You know, they haven't been invented yet. No bombs, grenades, nothing. They had nothing to get these things down. So therefore they said what? We can't do it. In fact, they went as far as to say what? God can't do it. So what was their decision? Oh, Caleb and Joshua, two of the spies said, let's go in. We can do it. But the people said what? We cannot. Let's go back to Egypt. Let's go back to slavery. Let's go back. We'll apologize. For the whole ten plagues thing. The whole army being drowned. Listen, we'll apologize and we'll say we'll work for you forever for free. That makes sense, doesn't it? And sometimes we can fall into that trap, can't we? The obstacles are too big. This can never be overcome. I can never be happy again. I can never have peace again. Again, I can never have joy again. I can never love again. I can never this again. I can never have those great blessings of God ever again because the obstacles are too big. Who are we putting our faith in when we say things like that? Ourselves. Or the ways of the world. Who are we forgetting is on our side? God is on. Who did the people forget was on their side? God. Now here's the thing. That generation that said, no, we can't do it, God punished them. They never received the full blessings of God, did they? Did God still take care of them? Yes. Did He still watch over them? Yes. But they never got that full blessings. So I want you to think about that. The next generation comes up on Jericho. And for basically the past 38 years, what has everybody been telling them? Can't do it. (laughs) The entire generation, their parents and their grandparents, whoever was there, has been telling this generation, when you get to that land, we turned around because the walls are too big. And you'll see, you'll see it's impossible. You'll see you can't do it. But could they? So let me ask you something. Should we listen to those who've gone before? (laughs) Should we listen to the doubters? Should we listen to those who failed before? Who should we listen to? In fact, what had God said? Let's go to Numbers. 
chapter 33. Numbers 33, verse 50. Numbers 33.50 And the Lord spake unto Moses in the plains of Moab by Jordan near where? Jericho. (laughs) Now, Moses isn't going to go in the land, but he's going to look over into it. And what city is he going to see when he looks in the land? A big walled city. Probably the biggest of them. He's going to see what those spies saw. (laughs) And God says to him there, Do you think God chose this place for a reason? You think he brought him to the biggest city for a reason? He says, we're going to face our fears here, aren't we? And what did he say to Moses as he looked across into the promised land, where the promises were all fulfilled, where all those things, what did he say to him in verse 51? Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When you are passed over Jordan into the land of Canaan, then you shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you and destroy all their pictures and destroy all their molten images. And quite plucked down all their high places. So, did they have pictures of their gods and things like that? Were they iconic? Oh, yeah, they had icons and things like that. Interesting. Verse 53. And you shall dispossess the inhabitants of the land and dwell therein, for I have given you the land to possess it. What does God say? I will bless you. Who's going to do it? He's going to do it. He's going to give them the land. It's going to happen. And who is he supposed to tell that to? Who is most supposed to tell that to? The people say, hey, listen, guys, I've seen it. Yes, I've looked over there. Yes, we're by Jericho. Yes, it's a big city. Yes, it's about, and I know what your parents said. I know your parents turned around and said it was too big and it couldn't happen and they were fearful because they didn't trust God. Let me tell you something. God just told me we're going to win. Let me ask you something. Has God told you you're going to win? <laughs> yes. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. And I go to what? Prepare a place for you. How many winners we got here today? <laughs> Will God take us to that promised land? Well, in the meantime, though, we've got to fight and scrap all by ourselves, right, though? No, what does he say? I will never leave you nor forsake you. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me beside the still waters, Right? He takes me to those green pastures. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will what? Fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Who wrote that? David, who never had a problem in his life. No! Oh boy! He had some obstacles, didn't he? He had some struggles. How could he have peace? How could he, that's my, one of my favorite psalms and where, Jesus, where, where David writes about all of his problems. And he said, I gave it to the Lord and I had a good night's sleep. <laughs> what does a good night's sleep mean? Peace. And I woke up in the morning and everything was fine. Troubles were still there. But who was with him? God is with you. So, what is God doing here? The people were afraid. They saw the obstacle and said it can't be done. They walked away from it. Should we do that? No. When you see those obstacles, when you see the storm, when you see the raging waters around you, when you see the struggles you're going through, remember, your God is bigger. And what has your big God promised? He'll be with you. He's never promised just to take them away. He's never promised just to get rid of them. He's never, but he also always promised to get you through them, hasn't he? And does he know how much you can take? Does he know when he needs to step in? Does he know when he needs to give you a helper? Yes, he does. Do you trust him is the question. What about the people? Did they trust him? Kind (laughs) of. See, that next generation had the same opportunity to go into the promised land. Who was going to be their leader this time? It was going to be Joshua. Moses died on that plain overlooking Jericho. He died there in the plains of Moab. And it was Moses' turn. I mean, Joshua's turn. Did Joshua have some doubts? Yeah, in fact, when we have doubts, what will God do for us? He'll do what he did to Joshua. Let's look at Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1.
What will God do for us as we see these big obstacles? First, he'll remind us of his promise, right? Then sometimes he'll even give us a little pep talk. How many like a good pep talk? Get you fired up. They say, hey, we can do this. And this is what this is. Joshua had doubts. Joshua was scared. You have to remember, he's one of the only two people who's actually stood by one of these cities. <laughs> he knows how big it is. He also knows these people, doesn't he? He also knows that who is dead. And who is all this resting on? You talk about struggles. You talk about fear. You talk about stress. Joshua had it all. Did God know that? And what did God do? Joshua 1.1. Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Does God understand what we're going through? Does he understand what the struggle is? This was one of them. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. I've given it to you already. I already know the path through this. It was going to take them seven years, but what, were they going to be victorious? Were they going to win? Yeah, just trust me, Moses. I mean, Joshua, sorry. Joshua, every place, verse 3, that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. I keep my promises. Does God keep his promises, folks? Remember that. When you have doubts, when you're scared, when you don't know what to do, remember, does God keep his promise? Absolutely. And is he strong enough to keep his promise? Verse 4, from the wilderness of this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites. Remember before, what what did the the spies come back and say? Oh, the Hittites are there. Ooh, scary. We can't take it. What does God say? I'm giving you their land. (laughs) And unto the great sea, toward the going down of the sun, shall shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Now, if you're Joshua, what are you feeling? Feeling better. I'm not in this on my own. (laughs) Moses is gone, but God is still with me. Just as he was with Moses, he's with me. He will never leave me. He will never forsake me. He will never fail me. Yay! Who else here can say that? (laughs) He says that to every one of us, doesn't he? No matter what the obstacle. God will be with us. He will see us through. Verse 6. Therefore, what? Be strong and of a good courage. For unto this people shalt thou divide for inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. And when we trust God, where should we go? Go to his word. Will God keep the promise of his word? Shall we study his word? Shall we know his word? In fact, look at verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. See, so here's the key, folks. God comes and gives them a pep talk, but then he says what? Remember to read the book. Right? He not only gives them that moment of courage, that moment of clarity, but then he says what? Read this, because it will remind you what? I'm still there with you. I've done it before. I'll do it again. All the stories of Moses, go back and read them again. Read the law again. Remember our relationship. Stick close to me. Verse 9. Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. Don't be afraid. Don't get discouraged. Don't stop. Keep going, because I will be with. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Here's a trick. If you're ever feeling overwhelmed, ever feeling like you need a pep talk, where can you go? Joshua 1, (laughs) 1 through 9. Just have it by your bed. Put it to your refrigerator. Put it in your car when you're stuck in traffic. No matter what the obstacle is, no matter what the struggle is, no matter what the stress is, no matter what the storm is, read that, because that's not just for Joshua, is it? That's a promise for who? All of his people. He will keep his promises. He will bless us. We just need to what? Be strong, be courageous, be obedient. 
He'll be there with for us, won't he? Just trust him. So we have God here kind of intervening. So the obstacles were big. Everybody told him that. It was going to be hard. But God promised to give him that land, didn't he? Therefore he gave him a pep talk saying, I will give you this. I will be there for you. But that's not the only thing he did. He also gave him a little more encouragement. We're going to see this more and more for these battles. When somebody is struggling, God will encourage. How did he encourage them this way? Let's go to chapter 2, verse 1. Joshua chapter 2, verse 1. And Joshua the son of Nun sent out of Shittim two men to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, even Jericho. And they went and came into an harlot's house named Rahab and lodged there. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, there came men in hither tonight of the children of Israel to search out the country. And the king of Jericho sent unto Rahab, saying, Bring forth the men that are come unto thee, which are entered into thine house, for they be come to search out all the country. And the woman took the two men and hid them, and said thus, There came men unto me, but I know not where they went. Okay? So, what does he do? He sends in spies again. Not twelve this time. He sends two. Right? Because last time there were only two good ones. So just send the two good ones. No? That's not how it works? Okay. So he sent in two, and immediately, it looked like things were going to go bad. Right? Looks like it was it was going to spoil. <laughs> they were found out. Everybody knew. Sent men to us, but what they they happened to go into the person of the one house who what believed <laughs> and was willing to hide them, was willing to help them, was willing to put their, her faith in God. And you think it's a mistake that she's part of the line of Jesus Christ? <laughs> a woman of faith. That's the one they found. By the way, will God do that for us too? Will he put the right people in the right place to encourage us and help us along the way? He will do that. But she says something very interesting. Let's keep going. Verse 6. But she had brought them up to the roof of the house and hid them with the stalks of flax which she had laid in order upon the roof. And the men pursued after them the way to Jordan under the fords. As soon as they were pursued after them, were gone out, they shut the gate. So she said they went away. So they said, oh, maybe they went over there. And they all went away. So now these two guys are with her on the roof, verse 8. And before they were laid down, she came up unto them upon the roof. And she said unto the men, I want you to see this. Verse 9. I know that the Lord hath given you the land. How does she know that? Look what it says. And that your terror is fallen upon all of us. Who was afraid of the Israelites? Everybody in Jericho. That's the funny thing. You know that first time they came to the land of Canaan? Did you know that the people of Canaan were scared to death of them? But who turned around? (laughs) The Israelites. (laughs) Isn't that funny? And now they're coming again, and who's afraid of them? The entire city of Jericho is shaking in their boots about these Israelites. In fact, why? And that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. Not just Jericho, but the whole land knows. They're scared to death of you. Why? For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you. And when you came out of Egypt, and what you did under the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon, and as soon as we had heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man in Jericho because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. Isn't it funny that sometimes the enemy has more faith in God than we do? (laughs) Right? They realized how powerful he was because they heard the stories. They remembered that he opened up the Red Sea. They remembered what they did to the people of Egypt. They remembered what the fights. Who forgot those things? The Israelites. Same goes for us, folks. As we come upon the enemy, as we come upon the obstacles, as we come upon the storms, just remember, God has already prepared the way, hasn't he? Who has to remember that? We do. The obstacle already knows it's going to go away. (laughs) Right? May not admit it, but it knows. We're the ones that have to remember all the things. How many here is God blessed? How many here has God seen them through storms? How many here has God helped along the way? 
How many have seen God do great and mighty things in your life? The enemy, Satan, shakes at the power of God. What should we do? Stand firm, encouraged, knowing the power of God, right? Because he's on whose side? Our side. So what do we got to worry about? Right? So remember that. So they were all shaking. There was no strength in that city. They all knew they were dead because the people of God were outside. So we need to remember that. He gave them encouragement because those two spies then went back and told who? All the people. And this time they knew that the people were ready, knew the guy was on their side, knew they were scared, knew they were going to win. All they needed was a little more encouragement. So what happened? Let's go to chapter 3, verse 9. Again, what was the sign that the people of Jericho and the people of the land knew that God was with them? Well, he split the Red Sea. So now several times, God has said, when you cross over Jordan, this is what's going to happen. How are they going to get across the Jordan? (laughs) Nobody seems to have asked that, right? Everybody keeps saying, when you get on the other side, when you get across the Jordan, but how do you get a million people across the river? Well, you do this. Joshua chapter 3, verse 9. And Joshua said to the children of Israel, Come hither and hear the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, Hereby you shall know that the living God is among you, and that he will, without fail, drive out from before you the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Hivites and the Perizzites and the Gershites and the Amorites and the Jebusites. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth passes over before you into Jordan. Now therefore take you twelve men out of the tribes of Israel, out of every tribe one man. And it shall come to pass as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests that bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of Jordan, that the waters of Jordan shall what? Be cut off from the rivers that come down from above, and they shall stand upon a heap. They will back up. And what will they be able to cross along? Dry land. Now, Joshua was just saying that, right? Just to try to encourage them. But what actually happened? Exactly. And the priests took up the Ark of the Covenant, and as soon as they put their feet in the water, the water just backed up, and all of it became dry, and a million people just walked right across. Is that an encouragement to them? Sometimes we need a little sign. Sometimes we need not just memory, but we need a little activity. And will God help us? And I like how he used the same sign twice, didn't he? Just like they came out of slavery through a dry land. They're going into the blessings in a dry land, aren't they? And why did he do it this way? Just as Joshua said, so they will know that God is with them. That they will know that the mighty God is with them. That they will know that he will not fail them. And as they walked across that land, everyone was reminded, God is with us. And they came up to Jericho, and they said, all we need now is a plan. How are we going to take it down? And what was the grand plan? Well, Joshua spent all night devising this wonderful way to take out the city. No, that's not happened. Who gave them the plan? God did. And what was this fantastic plan? Walk around the city. Do what? No, just walk around the city. Yeah. Walk around one day, two days, just once, three days, once, four, five, six Six days in a row, just get up in the morning, walk around, go back, have lunch, relax the rest of the day. And on the seventh day, I want you to walk around seven times. And at the end, here comes the kicker, I want everybody to scream as loud as you can. Okay. Now, how many of you, the first day, would have felt a little silly? Yeah, a little little weird. We just walked around and nothing happened. But, you know, people inside, what do you think they're thinking? Oh, they're finding a way in, finding a way in. Next day they walked around again. They didn't do anything. The next day they walked around again. Everybody's confused inside. And outside they're like, what are we doing this? What's supposed to happen? And when we scream, what's supposed to happen? But did they scream? Did they walk? Did they scream? And what did happen? The obstacle fell down. Miraculously. I'm sure some Scientologists or scientists will sit there and say, all the reason why 
walking around unsettled the base of this great city and the yelling created a vibration that knocked it all down. And anybody starts down that road, just say one thing. Rahab's house did not. <laughs> just remind them of that. Which again, I think it's another sign that God is like, hey, I'm in complete control here. And when they yelled, did the walls fall down? And did they charge in? And did they defeat the enemy? Same goes for us. But you notice here, what's required for victory? Follow the plan. And sometimes that's hard. One of God's greatest plans for us is something called, Be still and know that I am God. (laughs) I hate that plan. You know why I don't like that plan? Because I've yeah, I got to be still. i got to do nothing. <laughs> i got to wait. I don't like to wait. I like to do. I like to fix. How many want to fix now? But sometimes God says what? It will be fixed in due time. You may just have to go walk around a city once. You may have to do something that seems totally unrelated. You may have to go do something that makes no sense. You may have to go do something that you're like, why am I wasting my time? But does God have a plan? And will that plan work? Absolutely it will. And we will see it if we're just willing to fulfill the plan and trust him. So, how did it all work? Joshua chapter 6, verse 15 Joshua chapter 6, verse 15, And it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early about the dawning of the day and compassed the city after the same manner seven times. Only on that day they compassed the city seven times. And it came to pass on the seventh time when the priests blew with the trumpets, Joshua said unto the people, Shout! For the Lord God hath given you the city, and the city shall be accursed, even it and all that is therein, to the Lord only. Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all that is within her house, in the house. Because she hid the messengers that were sent. And is that what happened? And all the walls fell down. And they charged forth. And they won. And they had a complete and utter victory. Was it because they did it? Was it because they had the strength? No, because they trusted God. How about us, folks? How many of you are facing a struggle? How many of you are facing obstacles? How many think this is impossible? Well, it's impossible on our own. But with God, what is possible? All things are possible. So what do we need to do? We need to trust Him. We need to talk to Him. (laughs) We need to not give up. We need to not fear. Not worry. Just give it to Him and be patient and let God work. So just a few thoughts as we wind this up. What enemy or obstacle stands in your way? Think about them. They're there. And sometimes they can be huge. So what do we do? Well, think of it first of all. Ask yourself, how do you perceive it? How do you see that obstacle? Again, the people saw it as what? Impossible. Impossible. Walled cities, too big, too great. No way we can do it. Not even God can do it. We're out of here. Well, is that true? That's not true. There is no obstacle too big for God. There is no struggle too big for God. There is no storm too big for God. We've got to trust Him, don't we? Because is our God bigger than the obstacles? You have to ask yourself, what, how am I going to react to this? Am I going to quit? <laughs> am I going to turn back? Am I going to fear? Am I going to get discouraged? Am I just going to give in? No. Because who's with you? God is with you. And plus you have what? Other people too. We're there for you. We'll pray for you. We'll be there for you. We'll help you, right? We're in this together. We will see this through. Then ask yourself too, what has God promised? (laughs) Yeah. Remember God's promises, because does God always keep his promises? Is he a truthful God? He cannot lie. Is he also a powerful God? There is a difference between the two, right? There's two reasons people don't keep their promises. One, they never intended to. And second of all, they can't. Do any of those apply to God? 
<laughs> he makes the promises, he intends to keep it. And by the way, who can stop him? Nobody. And what has God already done in your life? Remember those things. That's what Israelites, that's what I, can't, I can't imagine the first time they came to that, to the blessings of the, of the promised land, saw all those things and said, God can't do it. Because what had God already done? Had he gotten them out of slavery? Had he defeated the Egyptians? Had he brought them through dry land on the Red Sea? Had he provided food? Had he beat the enemies out there in the wilderness? I mean, what had he not done? And yet they said, he can't do this. Let me ask something. What can God do? What has God already done? The last question is, have you prayed? (laughs) Have you given it to God? Have you talked to him about it? See, Joshua talked to him about it, and he got a pep talk. Have you read his word? Are you staying close to it? Because that's when we're really strengthened, isn't it? When we remember God's promises, remember what he has done, remember how great and powerful he is, and then the obstacles just get smaller and smaller and smaller. In fact, if you've got a pen on your paper, right there on your paper... Right there, right at the top, where it says winning the battles, right under this, says facing impossible uh, obstacles. Just scratch out impossible. (laughs) Scratch it out. Because there is what? No such thing for the children of God. We're just facing obstacles. Just speed bumps in in the road of life. That's all they are. And will God get us through all this? Yes. Will we win? Absolutely. With God's help, we can. So remember that. Remember the Battle of Jericho. But remember, it's still true today. No matter how big that obstacle is, or how tough that storm, God will see you through. Just stick close to Him. Follow the battle plan. And it's going to be okay. okay? Now next week, we're going to learn, uh, don't think they're too small. <laughs> okay? Eh, a, little bit, a little bit back and forth here. So don't think they're too small. You can take care of them yourself. Okay? We'll learn that in AI next week.